hello, all right then. Not, uh, I would say quite honest, the biggest group, not the biggest turnout, but I hope that you're not thinking right now, Ooh, why am I here to do something wrong? Um, I guess it's been a long day and uh, I know for myself, if I go to a conference, then uh, a lot of things uh, and uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts um, are sort of, uh, you know, thrown at you at the very end. It's probably like, oof, can I take much more? But then on the other hand, I'm thinking that when I go to a restaurant, I oftentimes judge it by the dessert, so the last course. So I hope that uh, you leave this conference with a good judgment based on the final course here. Um, I mean, with you know this uh, sort of small group here, I think we can make this quite interactive. So uh, please, at any point in time, if you have any kind of questions, if you think something deserves a special discussion, let's do that. I don't really intend to stand here for 40 minutes just telling you something. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Michael. I'm uh, from Contiamo. Uh, and the name is Italian. Uh, it means we count, but we're actually based in Berlin. So uh, originally from Germany, uh, now about 60 people um, and uh, have been working with a lot of the big German corporates, uh, now really going out and visiting nice places like Stockholm. Um, so um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, how data virtualization can help uh, data projects and help to, as we say, make them radically more agile and especially how it integrates with uh, a data catalog and data governance because we think that these concepts can really work nicely together. So um, what I want to start with is kind of the, well, I would say often very common uh, way of how getting a new data use case off the ground looks like uh, currently. Um, and uh, I think we would all agree that that might not be the ideal process, but uh, you know, for uh, many companies and many setups, it looks something like this. So let's say uh, a data scientist wants to build a new customer churn model, and uh, you get together with the business owner or the business sponsor who says that, oh, I would really like to understand how customer churn is developing, what drives it, and how can we sort of build a model for the future where, um, you know, based on some characteristics of a customer or some behavior, we can say, oh, well, this customer seems like he's churning, so maybe we uh, ad try to address them with some um, campaign. So people get together, usually include somebody from IT, uh, discuss the use case, then uh, there's sort of a search for the data, and that doesn't mean that you don't know whether the database is, but you need to know what are the tables, what are the data sets that are relevant for this use case. That not necessarily happens in the same meeting. Uh, you have to find the data owner, uh, especially if it's data that is uh, you know, protected under GDPR, if there's any PII data in there, somebody needs to say, all right, this is okay to use it for this use case. Then um, somehow that needs to be documented, ideally. Then depending on what that data consumption looks like, uh, some ETL happens if it's not already in a central place or in the quite the right format for that data consumer. So maybe the data scientist needs you know, certain tables uh, in a certain uh, way, in a certain format, and then data access happens. And uh, you know, sometimes that still works in a way that data is exported and then shipped. Sometimes it works to a central um, sort of a point of access or a central data warehouse, a central data lake. But oftentimes, this is how things look. And um, we think that, you know, from our experience, often that takes weeks, sometimes even months to go through. So um, if we look at, you know, some of these steps here and how we think data virtualization can, he uh, can help, then uh, let's start first with this last part because I think that's, if you know what data virtualization is, no worries, I'll get into the details. But then that's where people would usually think data virtualization will help because Traditionally, it has been sort of an alternative to uh, ETL. Um, so let's look at uh, this part first. So the challenge um, obviously is that uh, on one hand, we have you know, a data landscape, lots of different data sources. Uh, on the other hand, we have the data consumers. And um, somehow, we need to sort of bring these two parties together to create something where you know, data flows from one side to the other. Um, if we use sort of these traditional ETL pipelines, so we extract data, we transform it, we somehow make it available, or even in our data warehouse, we create sort of specialized, you know, if you think of each one of those lines here as one specialized prepared data set for one consumer, then we end up with a lot of these dependencies here. And uh, 
that can be slow and inefficient because it takes time. Um, it's very difficult to sort of maintain transparency to understand so who from here uses what in here or what on the left side. And uh, it also really enables and kind of drives what we call uh, shadow data. So that's, um, you know, people kind of saying, oh, you know, all this centralized way of doing things that kind of takes too long. So I'll just go ahead and export some of that data and I'll do a lot of data uh, merging and data, data wrangling here and I'll keep it actually available for myself or whenever I need it. And that means that you kind of lose track of that from a you know central and from a transparency and compliance a point of view. So this is where data virtualization comes in. Um, and what data virtualization is, in essence, is you kind of present a virtual database that does not really hold any data um, to the consumer. So a data consumer um, and you know it could be a BI uh, tool, it could be a data science um, use case. It could also or it can also be an operational use case where you're trying to sort of integrate data to, with different systems. What they see is really this sort of virtual database uh, that they can interact with that gives them just their kind of view that they need to see of the data landscape without seeing any of this sort of complexity of that they're actually talking with multiple data sources. So that's what traditional um, data virtualization is. And uh, you know, maybe some of you have heard that term before. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we're sort of on the same page here. Um, then if a query comes in, so if somebody wants to access data sort of on demand, um, you know, the query will go to the data virtualization layer, which will then say, oh, I can actually answer that query by, in this case, going to SQL Server, going to Hadoop, and like pulling out the right data, combining it, shipping it back. So the whole idea here is we're kind of decoupling the data consumers from the data storage. And that's what traditional uh, data virtualization does. Um, it's also quite powerful, especially in use cases where um, it's very difficult to physically integrate everything together. So these days, uh, a lot of companies are working with hybrid architectures. We have some data that's still on premise, some data in different data warehouses, some data that's in the cloud. Uh, maybe we're trying to migrate more and more into that. So we have few customers who are working with, you know, say, Teradata, um, trying to migrate more and more to the cloud, getting rid of some of those licenses, maybe. Um, and so in the meantime, for quite a few years, they have this really hybrid setup. So in these cases, I think that's where traditionally uh, data virtualization really shines, because it can basically expose all of this data landscape, regardless of where it is, as if it was just in one place and can be accessed through one place. And of course, um, you might say, oh, you know, um, we have ETL for that, so why don't we just physically ship all the data into one place, or why don't we just put it into a data lake, and there then we sort of create um, sort of different versions of the data and make it available to the consumers. Well, I think there's a, there's a difference really in the approach here. So traditional ETL, you're copying all of the data, uh, usually in some kind of a batch run, uh, maybe that data lags behind, but oftentimes it not only lags behind in terms of the data freshness, but also in terms of what part of the overall landscape it covers. So if somebody brings a new system online, then getting that integrated with the data warehouse uh, usually takes some time. Um, so one of the really big issues here oftentimes is that it's relatively static. So keeping the data warehouse really up to date and keeping it uh, you know, in, a, in a way that it really um, reflects all of the data landscape is quite difficult and oftentimes it's even the case that there's quite some data sources, as we like to call them often shadow data, that are not part of that data warehouse. Data virtualization on the other hand means that we're not actually physically copying all of that data but we're just basically in a central place storing the location plus the knowledge about how we can access that data. And then we're making it look, and that's the important thing, just like here, we're making it look as if it's in one place, although it isn't really, and it's physically still in all those other places where it originates from. And that means that we get you know, flexibility, we're quite agile, uh, we can simply basically adjust the view of the data here, and that means that then the consumer, when they query again, they'll have this new updated view. Now, um, you might say, and that's... Uh, you know, something that often comes up. Uh, well, aren't there issues with that? Aren't we then depending 
on the underlying data sources and maybe you know up here you have some operational systems that aren't really known for their speed when answering analytical queries or uh, you know you don't really want to affect a really important production system with somebody running uh, you know a uh, let's say a BI report that hasn't been coded quite right and then really issues a query that brings down that kind of, uh, let's say, your CRM system. Of course, uh, that is a mini often mentioned problem with data virtualization. Um, so, um, just to uh, sum that up, um, you know, the databases uh, that basically are being queried could be too slow, or you have these sort of essential. Uh, databases that you want to protect from these kind of hard uh, analytical queries. And that's something where people have traditionally said, oh, you know, data virtualization, it's a nice concept, it sounds nice, uh, but mm, in production we're actually quite scared of deploying that because we really want to protect and kind of separate operational systems from analytical systems. Well, um, there is a nice sort of idea out there and a nice um, tendency I would say um, in you know what's happening in products and that's that uh, they're really trying to combine sort of the best of both worlds um, and um, who here has an idea of what a materialization is of data so when you materialize data all right yeah I, I know your background in the Oracle databases and so yeah I uh, know what it means is um, um, basically it's a temporary cache of the data um, so in a way, it does similar things as you know as you would do with ETL. So it basically takes some of this data and says, "All right, we've had this query a lot of times, um, and we want to you know cache some of this data here for a certain time or until we you know see some changes in the source systems, and that really helps to offload some of this." you know, analytical queries and this query load from the source systems. So the idea here is to say, basically on a per use case basis, depending on what my data consumer needs, I can tell them that, well, you're going straight through to the source system, so you see the absolute, you know, most current and freshest data that there is, or you're seeing that, well, they run a report and they really look at more, you know, daily values or so, and then you basically tell them that, well, you're actually running on data that's, um, you know, only recomputed every couple of hours here. The nice thing about this is that it's way more flexible than just doing ETL because you can basically switch between these two modes. You can decide on how often this should be refreshed and to the consumer it makes absolutely no difference. So you can basically move between ETL and data virtualization depending on the use case, depending on sort of the load um, at any time. Um, so yeah, I said the idea really is to sort of combine the best of both worlds and the idea um, that I think makes all of this really nicely scalable is that you know this materialization here other than some of the let's say source systems that might not be so easily scalable or only at a certain expense this here could live in some you know somewhat modern let's say cloud-based systems like Redshift, like BigQuery, et cetera, uh, or you know, other more scalable on-premise uh, solutions or even open source databases. And so if you do that, you then have a really nice and scalable way of building these materializations, of offloading some of the queries hitting the underlying systems, while at the same time you have still that flexibility of um, creating um, you know, views on data. Yes, please. Right, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very valid point, so I'm, uh, I hope that makes sense that uh, if you know something changes here, then with ETL you're adjusting the pipeline, so the code itself, because it refers to individual, let's say, columns. 
yeah, somebody has to do that, but you also have to manually maintain uh, kind of the target schema. So in your database, somebody needs to go in and say, all right, we need to now add that column here as well so that we can then populate it in the in the ETL. Well, yeah, in data virtualization, um, you basically just update the view on the data and it automatically, you know, is reflected in, in here. Um, so I think that's basically where we think data virtualization can help. And then, you know, ideally, um, as said, really bringing together some of the benefits of ETL, which is physically aggregated, pre-computed data that really speeds up queries, offloads queries from operational source systems with this flexibility of data virtualization for just maintaining a view rather than a copy of data. And um, we think that, you know, that concept is quite nice to really tackle these first two parts of our, sort of, let's say, agile data uh, or hopefully agile data delivery process, but we think that that's a really good step for then going even further. And um, so what we really like to uh, to think about is how we can also enable these first two steps here, or first two sections of this data delivery process. And of course, if we look at the at the very beginning here, then um, you know it's something that uh, really starts with discovering data, searching for data. And so the answer to that uh, these days would usually be called uh, a data catalog. So a place where a data consumer, in this case, I um, mean, we said it's a data scientist wanting to build a churn, a customer churn model, where they can go and say, oh, I will just look first what data sets are available, who in the organization has the knowledge, uh, you know, being able to explain some of the, the origin of that data to me. Um, and I should be able to sort of browse through all of these data sources. Well, it's uh, kind of nice then that in you know data virtualization, because that sits in between the consumers here on the right hand side and the um, data sources, the data virtualization solution has access to all of these data sources because otherwise it couldn't work, right? That's that's really what it does. It, it lives there as this layer in between. So then the data virtualization can basically populate such a catalog. Uh, it can basically say, hey, look, this is, all of the different data that you have across all of these different data sources. And it can, because it's able to query these data sources. So go in and issue a query against each one of these data sources. It can not only issue query against, against these data sources to you know, satisfy here somebody's demand in terms of what question they want to answer, but what the data virtualization platform can also do is it can go in and say, oh, let me examine some of these columns, some of this data with a profiler, meaning that it will look through the data and say, oh, look, this seems to be a first name, a last name. This seems to be uh, personal identifiable information. That seems to be the product SKU that I found. So this product SKU in HANA, I found actually in the Hadoop data lake in one of the files there. So doing that, a data virtualization layer can then automatically populate a catalog. And um, if there's one thing that I think is important about any kind of data catalog, so if you imagine this data scientist coming to this sort of nicely browsable directory or marketplace, people call it, where they can search through data sets, understand who's the owner of it, one of the most important things about this is that it's up to date and it's not necessarily only manually maintained. So it doesn't really diverge from you know, what's happening here, but it needs to be up to date. So if a data virtualization solution has basically access to these data sources, then it can maintain and automatically update as much as possible of this catalog. And um, so what that then can result in is basically a really nice data catalog that you can browse the distributed data sets in um, that is really setting everything up for sort of self-service consumption. Um, it can ideally intelligent discover um, the lineage, so how does data really end up from you know one source to another, um, and uh, it, the data profile, and by profile we mean things like, oh look, this seems to be PII data which should be protected, this seems to be your sort of SKU that you're using everywhere, these sort of things. And um, so we're definitely of the opinion if you are interested in a data catalog, in something that is sort of the consumer, so data consumer, not uh, you know your uh, consumers of uh, your business uh, or your services, but if you're interested in building anything that's sort of facing the data consumers, so BI analysts, um, 
data scientist, then having something that automatically tries to stay up to date, reflects the most current structure of the data landscape is absolutely fundamental in making a data catalog a success. Uh, if a data catalog requires uh, a lot of sort of human expertise to stay up to date with the data landscape, then uh, I think that's very, very difficult to maintain. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it, it's a, in the end, it's a combination of uh, sort of human experts labeling things, and then the system ideally bringing up recommendations and saying, "Oh, look, this seems to be the same. Do you want to sort of lock this in and say, yes, it is the same?" So um, it, it's basically supporting the experts in making these decisions. Um, but what is important is that it's actively surfacing, surfacing all of these sort of ideas and labels from exposing yeah, from what it has learned, basically what you have tagged before or what uh, basically the data science models say that, hey, look, this seems to be an address. It's pretty obvious based on the structure of the content. But I think that's a, um, a sort of fundamental concept in our opinion for any data catalog to really work is that it needs to be really linked to the data automatically because if it's purely done by sort of human experts sitting down and keeping it up to date, it'll always go out of sync. Uh, or it's an incredible amount of work. Um, right, just to give you an idea of you know how, how a data catalog can then look like, and, and what's really important in our opinion in a data catalog, and there are lots of different things out there, but our opinion is that a data catalog, if it enables um, exchange of data within an organization and discovery of data, then it has to be something that allows for not so technical people to find what they're looking for. So it's the business owner often that uh, kind of looks into it and then tells data scientists, oh, I found this, this, and this. Do you think we could build something on that? Um, and it should not be kind of a inventory on a super detailed level of what you have in your data warehouse, because you can get that somewhere else, but it should really enable sort of these less technical um, consumers. We've seen that that can make a big difference in organizations in terms of bringing people together and getting everyone to think about, oh, what do we have? What could we, we do with it? Who do I need to talk with? And uh, yeah, as we said, or as I said, um, we think that data virtualization kind of really helps in, in keeping this up to date. Um, right. Um, so then, um, with um, you know data virtualization that provides a, a catalog, what we get is a central place where we have this virtual DB exposing the data. But as we know, data alone is is not so helpful. But it also provides all that metadata on top across the whole data landscape. Um, now, there's still one section missing, and that's, okay, somebody has found what they want. Uh, we can provide that data to them, uh, plus the metadata. But now the question is, and especially I think with GDPR, this has become even more pressing, should they be able to consume that data? Is it in line with the purpose restrictions on that data? Is it aligned with policies? Is it aligned with risk management of how, what amount of data should be visible and in which you know kind of life cycle of a data, data project? So if somebody does a pilot, Let's say this data scientist wants to build this churn model. Should they start out and get access to the full customer database plus all of the customer behavior plus you know all of I don't know maybe some uh, customer NPS scoring that we have received, or should they say that you know or should we say that they start out their initial prototype with a little bit less data, maybe with some samples, maybe we mask some of the customer identifiers just so that they can validate their model. And as we then promote this project from a pilot or POC up to something we want to run on a you know, daily basis or we want to put into production, we probably apply more uh, you know, IT security kind of standards to it and we see how all of this code is being run. Then we give them access to everything. And that's often the case. Um, so I think risk management in terms of data leaks, uh, risk management and uh, compliance with GDPR have really uh, made this, uh, these two steps uh, a lot more relevant. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, and so my plan now is to of course, show how I think data virtualization can help with that. Um, 
and in the end, it's really like providing the right view again to the consumers, saying that, well, for the current state of your project, you don't need to see the customer's name, so we'll just hash that. Or we use something that is called um, differential privacy. So in your case, you do not need to go down to the individual, basically, rows in the data, but it's totally fine if you work with sort of aggregations of five rows um, and you're not able to drill down as you know, deep enough to identify individual customers. Um, and we think that, yeah, data virtualization can provide that. But the nice thing is that you're not locking it in. You're not saying like, oh, this is the ETL that we've set up and it's providing exactly this for this consumer. But you can update it any time when you promote that use case or you're saying, oh, now it's going to production. Um, and that's, I think, what, what really makes it um, really flexible. So, um, yeah, how does data virtualization enable governance? Um, well, um, we believe that data virtualization um, sees all of the queries going through. And so if you think of a query going through from the data landscape, uh, from the data consumers to the data landscape, you can say that, well, this is a great place, as a single place, to apply policies. Uh, and a policy for us, you know, coming from this data virtualization background means it's basically rewriting the query. So one of the consumers here might ask for, hey, show me the top 10 customers. Um, by a revenue uh, in the last month and then list them by their customer ID. Um, and then the policy might say, well, sure, you can get the top 10 customers, you can get them ranked by uh, the revenues in the last month, but unfortunately, or fortunately for the company, we have a policy that you can't see uh, the customer ID, so it's masked out for you. Um, and that's basically where data virtualization then comes in and says, okay, well, you're querying for custom ID, but this policy is in place. So instead of actually querying for custom ID, I'll just replace it with a hash here at this point. And that's how it's quite easy to uh, implement data policies uh, and access policies that are quite powerful. Um, and the nice thing is that if you one day want to change things, and you want to say now, okay, this we want to because it's in a certain, you know, deployed in a certain place where people should actually see the customer IDs. We want to enable access to the true customer IDs. You just make a switch and a change to the policy and suddenly the consumers see the full picture. So again, like with, you know, initially providing the right data to consumers compared to ETL and keeping it agile, here again in the governance you're quite flexible in going from somewhat restrictive in the beginning to, you know, more loose data access as you roll something out and as it goes into production. Um, so the way it works is, as I said, a query goes through. Um, it's going through this virtualization layer and the policy is applies, with ba applies which basically means that uh, sensitive data is masked uh, or there are rules in place that, you know, you cannot access more than 100 results at a time. So there's no way for somebody to kind of scalably export the whole, uh, I don't know, 40 million customer database. Um, and you can apply things like differential privacy so you know that you're actually not doing anything on the data that identifies individuals in there. Um, all of these things can be applied. Now, what we um, basically um, support there, what we think is really uh, possible then is um, quite a flexible set of policies that you really uh, can you know, synchronize and discuss with the data owners and with your um, data privacy and data security. Um, so you can set up policies for source systems, you can set up policies on the sort of virtual DB level. Uh, you can then, you know, of course, have policies that apply to um, certain roles, uh, certain groups that you have in your Active Directory. Um, but you can also have policies that are for specific applications and use cases. Because one of the things that is uh, very important with GDPR is that a lot of the data here has been collected with certain purpose restrictions. And even though the same data scientist might be working on a churn model and a marketing campaign model, it doesn't mean that they're allowed to use the same data for both. So that is something that is very uh, comfortable to sort of be implemented with policies because you can really have a very fine-grained control over things. So then, um, you know, if we have that in place, um, we can provide not only a simple view of all of the data without all of the complexity of going to all of those source systems, we can also provide the metadata so that you not only see the data and can work with it, but you also understand what it means. And then we're all doing that in a compliant way 
which is very important, and we're doing it in a way that it can actually be audited quite well. Because, and that's important, all of the queries are actually going through this layer. So every single one of them can be tracked. You can see that, oh, somebody is only allowed to access 100 records at a time, but they have really hit like another threshold where they've tried to, I don't know, access kind of in a loop a million records today, and that's definitely not what this was supposed to be or what it was set up for. Um, what you can also do is, based on this, based on actually seeing what queries go through this layer, you understand who's actually utilizing what. Um, and so I think that is taking this idea of a data catalog and taking it one step further. So a data catalog traditionally tracks what data sets exist. But um, if you set it up this way, you can also track who actually uses which data. And why is that important and why is that helpful? Well, because if you give people a way um, to request data access, they're always quite quick to ask for data access. But it's very uncommon that somebody will say, oh, and we no longer need this. Uh, or, you know, this sort of transformation and this extra data repository that you set up is no longer in use by us. That sort of shutdown notice almost never occurs. And so it's quite good to have this sort of central layer in place where you can see, oh, these are the actual queries going through. So now I know who's utilizing what, and I also know that uh, they've actually uh, you know, asked me to provide this, and I still need to uh, keep it up and keep it running. Yes? Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly the idea. You track which queries are going through, and you use that to understand, you know, after giving people comfortable ways of requesting access to actually see what are they using. Not in a way that you're basically monitoring everybody's single move or single query. If, I mean, of course you could do that, but more in understanding kind of how is the overall data landscape being used. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, but the, so that's, that's, of course, you can always go to the detailed log, but uh, ideally it's aggregated in a way that you understand, okay, the last query to this part of this data set was three months ago, so it doesn't really seem like we need to maintain it this way. Uh, that's the, yeah. Um, right. So, um, just to sort of give you a, a more technical, uh, <laughs> view into how a system like that can look. So um, as you can see, um, you know, it's important, of course, to provide different ways of consuming data, depending on what the data consumers want. Um, and that could be, I mean, some more technical terms here, JDBC, ODBC. So in our case, um, what our virtual DB looks like is a po it looks like a Postgres database, which we think is a very common way of sort of interacting with data. Um, and then as a query comes in, that's obviously parsed, so it's you know being understood by this layer. Uh, then there is a policy evaluator, which is you know really filled by the policies set up in uh, and applying to the data sources. Uh, there's a query optimizer, which then decides, okay, I can get some of this data from here, some of this data from there. I'll fir probably first get some data from here to then make a smaller query to another data set. Um, and of course, then there are connectors to all of these underlying data sources. So if you want to, all of this acts like a big translation layer. Um, and as I said, it has these, these different aspects and these different benefits. Uh, of course, as a translation layer, it can decouple, but it also allows for creating a data catalog and creating uh, the data governance um, policies. So then we believe that in the end, uh, if you have these things in place, you can really uh, arrive at a modern delivery process. You can have a data catalog, so our data scientist can go there, find what they require, uh, they can then, from that place, make the request for access. Um, somebody who's been assigned as the data steward, um, delegated basically the, the power to grant access and to make sure that access requests are in line with, um, with the policies, can create the policy, give access, and then the data consumer can access data right from there with the tools uh, that they require. And what's important here is, um, different from you know, uh, a data lake or a data warehouse, you're not moving everything into that system and you keep your sort of flexibility of how your actual data landscape looks like.
So um, one of the setup that we see a lot is especially this hybrid setup between a lot of stuff that's on premise, some stuff that's in the cloud, and still putting sort of one layer on top of it. Um, well, um, if I, uh, well, you know, want to I, uh, sort of sum things up and give you a couple of key takeaways that uh, key I think that, uh, uh, apply to uh, really, to you know, uh, really any kind of solution out there, then I think ideally today the decision is not um, is it ETL or data virtualization. You try to get the benefits of both by, uh, as I said initially, deciding on kind of a per use case basis where do we aggregate some data, cache some data, keep it in this sort of central layer and get all of the the speed uh, and performance characteristics of that and where do we actually require consumers to go through to the source systems because they need to see the most recent version of the data or the source system is very good at actually answering these queries. Um, so I would say that's definitely something that you see out there in the market and quite a few tools uh, and I think that's something to look out for. Um, then um, I think these intelligent materializations are key to doing that. So if a system can bring up certain performance uh, improvements and say, hey, this looks like a materialization that uh, is really helpful to your kind of query so sort of examining these queries, uh, then I think everything gets a lot simpler. And then third and probably the most important uh, idea for us, and we believe that's true regardless of how you set all of these things up technologically, uh, a data catalog, uh, data governance and data provisioning have to be really tightly integrated. Um, there are some data catalogs out there that are pretty much detached from the data sources, um, so they can't sort of automatically stay up to date and people sort of put exports of certain data structures in there, but it's, it's just never as sort of close to the data and up to date as if it's really you know, in contact with the data. Um, there are data governance tools that are not integrated with catalogs, so if somebody finds something and if you have certain, let's say, labels on the data, they can't be used in the policy. Uh, which is then requiring you to set all of that up again. And then finally, if somebody um, you know, finds something, asks for access, people shouldn't have to go to a third system, um, kind of seeing data catalog and data governance as a ticketing system to then go somewhere else and set up the access permissions. So in our opinion, if these things are integrated, that's when you know, the whole workflow uh, gets uh, really truly agile. Yeah. So I think that's uh, definitely think enough, that's for, uh, definitely for enough for now, for, um, for now. and I uh, would um, very much like to uh, open it up for questions. Any questions, feedback, Any comments, questions, concerns? Comments, concerns. I think it might be a bit late for questions. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Okay then. Um, okay yeah, if you're, um, I mean, if anybody yeah, is uh, interested I mean, in uh, sort of, in you know, getting a more, uh, you know, getting a more having a more in-depth uh, conversation, uh, conversation about this, we're very happy to do that. We're very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.